Andrea. Hello, Ishan. How's everything in Mumbai? Great. I have good news and bad news. I got a promotion in the company. And what's the good news? What? We'll have to move, won't we? I thought you wanted to move. Where are we going? Ah, I'll know soon, but I'll save that as a surprise for when I get home in a week. I see. I have someone at the door. Hello, you must be Peter. Sarah said you had questions about reformed druidism. Yes, thank you. So services are often held here out back? More often now, since people won't go into the spooky woods at night anymore. Come on in. Would you like some coffee? No thanks, I just had some with Sarah. Oh, yes, isn't she a lovely one? Yes, she is pretty. Nice. Um, she explained some of the basics, the two tenets, and the like, but I'm struggling with the details. I see. After every winter comes a spring. Excuse me? Oh, nothing. So she told you what a mess we are, right? Well, she kept mentioning how disorganized the reformed druids are. But she also mentioned your ideas about less is more. Right. As you can see, my kitchen here is not filled with clutter, so when I get home from work, cooking and cleaning is a snap. I know where everything is, and I've got plenty of space. My kids and husband can use it easily too. How does that apply to druidism? We have a very simple kitchen. Where different people can cook many different things. A basic template to add on to. And then, very importantly. To which we then return. That's kind of like Zen, isn't it? The emptiness of the bowl that provides utility. Oh, sure. A lot of religions ask us to keep it simple and devote time to the important things. This a gift to be simple, this a gift to be free, and all that. Reformed Druidism vigorously applies that idea to itself. Could you give me some examples? Where to begin? Reformed Druidism lacks so many things found in organized mainstream religions and even other druidical groups. We are defined, in a sense, by the many things we don't do. If we don't have something, and you really need it, then you borrow it from another group, do without it. Or create something yourself. Why does it give so many options? Our founders intended Druidism to be a supplement to their spiritual paths, not a substitute. As Sarah probably explained to you, the reformed Druidism straddles the fence between religion and philosophy. That position helps some of our members to practice Druidism, while still belonging to mainstream religions that might tolerate philosophical inquiry, but not religious crossovers. But some members only do Druidism. Sure. In our Jack Pine Grove, Craig and Tom are pretty much just reformed druids. But Sarah and Dan are Christian. I'm Hindu. And Jodi, she's our arch druidess. Well, she's just generally neo pagan. Some have no affiliation at all. Sarah mentioned you have quite a mix of folks here. Isn't it confusing? A little. Yet, we can all appreciate the same Earth Mother, share our traditions and come away more aware. It can be very beautiful and moving. Some folks are curious about their friends' participation, such as you with Sarah, right? Um, yes. 
But, getting back to less is more. Yes, I wrote down a quick list before you came. Mind you, there are some groves that have stronger focus, local customs or different opinions. Sure. Well, first and foremost, Reformed Druidism doesn't have a formal answer to the big questions of religion. We ask questions, but we differ on matters of an afterlife, free will, sin, creation, abortion, magic, etc. Without answers, how does it guide people? I don't know. I guess Druidism accompanies us more than guiding us. It provides a setting for us to question, observe and reflect, so we can come to our own answers. We also don't have an established canon of ethics. We encourage druids to lead a good life, considerate of others, but we think people get more out of figuring out morality for themselves. Few beliefs, no code of ethics. I guess that makes druidism open to just about anyone. And why not? Mandatory beliefs exclude potential members. For some, those big questions have already been addressed, or even firmly answered, by the other spiritual groups. Folks become druids to add nature spirituality to their religious practices, and to ask the kind of questions that can't be asked elsewhere. I can't help feeling the founders left druidism kind of half-cooked, unfinished. Why didn't they do more? It is rude of me to keep you standing here. Why don't we sit down in the living room? Ah, yes, it would have been easy to spin out some detailed theology, but you have to remember we began as a student protest in 1963 against mandatory religious attendance. The reformed druids purposely hindered the organizational progression to dogmatism. They didn't want their group to become the very thing they had rebelled against. So reformed druidism really is a product of the 60s? There's a lot of freedom in not having anything definite, I guess. Yeah. It's helpful that we don't own communal property. Instead, we meet in public places of natural beauty, and the lack of a paid priesthood also brings down our expenses to a few hundred dollars per year, mostly for food and drink at services. With everything you lack, it must be hard to compare Druidism with other religions. That's fine with us, we don't feel a need to compete or compare. And we still have a pretty good idea of who we are, without pigeonholes. I am glad the reform is so open. To me it shows courage to keep doors open and accept a little chaos. Doesn't that chaos leave a power vacuum that some crazy leader could take advantage of? <laughs> a cult leader would be most frustrated with our rebellious little reformed druids. The members we attract would never let anyone get much power. It would be like herding cats. Perhaps. But there have to be some unsavory characters that join. So what's the method to expel them? None. None? None, for me. Of course, we don't welcome or coddle such troublemakers. Instead, we preventatively talk of the importance of religious freedom, mutual respect, and ethics. Given all the planned disorganization, how can you have groves across the country and the world? A bare-bones international structure exists and seems self-maintaining. Historically, at least the archdruids of the groves kept in loose touch with each other. Technically, all the Third Order druids are part of the Council of Daylorne Plain Do, which organized and kept the groves interacting, but, that council requires a consensus. So little has been decided that way since the 1970s. And what happens now? Well, I suppose the groves have acted with greater and greater autonomy over the years. Anyway, 
I think the internet works a lot better than the council. It creates one large electronic community for discussion and debating, regardless of order. And that works well for everyone? Well, no. There are always people who want more organization and guidelines. But if they want to add formalities onto reform druidism, they tend to hive off into new branches of the reform. Or even separate organizations, like ADF. There have been quite a few schisms over the years, and we expect them. So how do they deal with really troublesome folk? Well, a grove can kick out its own members. But there is no total excommunication or defrocking by the whole reform. Ordinations are considered permanent, but I suppose they could be given up. Once a druid, always a druid. Even if totally shunned by others for their poor conduct. Seems a little foolish, doesn't it? Certainly a dilemma, has your grove had many problems. It is never pleasant dealing with such a member. We had quite a troubling time here with a fellow named Alan. About five years ago, as you may know. Whom? No, not yet. Who was he? Ah. No matter, all in good time. Besides, he's thankfully long gone now. Not to be rude, but you don't look Irish, and I understand that as the reformed druids don't believe all the customs of the ancient druids. So they also do not have to descend from the Celtic peoples. No offense taken. Many faiths blur the distinction between race, nationality and religion. We don't care about such things. Sure, some members, Craig and Dan for instance, became druids because of their Celtic background, but druidism accepts people of all backgrounds and identities. How did you come to druidism? I found the druids because I wanted a religious community I could belong to, since there are few Hindus in this part of Michigan. The focus on nature is important to me. After all, from the very beginning of human spirituality, nature had an important role to play. She still does. Have the Druids shown much interest in your culture from India? A little. It might be surprising, but many modern Druid groups are looking to other religious traditions to find practices that work for them. That said, the culture, language and traditions of your own ancestors may also be a big help in rooting your personal spiritual path. Like our religious diversity, the cultural mix also spices up our meetings. Oh goodness, I've certainly rambled on a bit and I think my kids would be returning soon. I'm grateful for your patience. Perhaps I'd like to talk with Craig about culture and druidry. I know very little about where my family comes from, perhaps a little bit Irish and French. Really? Well, I'm sure Craig will love to have you around. Feel free to come to our August 1st Festival of Lunasa. I know Sarah and I would love to see you there. Alright. Thanks. Bye. Ah, Sarah. Very interesting. What was I doing before? Oh. Now, what the devil is that man, Ishorn, up to now? Just when things were beginning to make sense.